floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santi. I suppose you, yes, you hear me now. Um, so you, you are just back from lunch, and uh, our idea is in a way to bring you into a kitchen. Not the kitchen of here, but the kitchen of transforming educational policies into change in schools, what is a, a really tricky challenge. And I would start by sharing a few questions with you. What do you think about the deepness and the sustainability of the changes that are happening in school after several decades? of policies to support innovation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about gaps sometimes appearing between school adopting all kind of initiatives supporting innovation and pockets in the system remaining quite close to it? Do you think that we are equipped with the tool we need to learn about what is happening around implementing policies into schools, particularly in the area of innovation. And the last question for you to think about is what did we learn during all those decades about what works, under which condition, and for which purpose? So those questions are the one at European School that we ask ourselves. And this is the reason why it has been decided to launch a series of case study. Each case study focusing on a specific initiative in one single country. So we, for that exercise, we don't think about running this large kind of survey, just collecting numbers very useful to indicate trends and frequency and all that, but not always helping us to understand what are the dynamics, what are the mechanisms in place to transform a policy into a change in the real uh, context. So we start the case study with Portugal that have expressed interest to, to be the, the first candidate and I would like to insist on the fact that those case studies that are a mix of desk research and study visit to schools and interviews and focus group with experts, the purpose is to learn. It is absolutely not an evaluation exercise. We want to learn at all levels. We hope that the delegation, the study group, visiting the country, interviewing the school, the expert. We learn something for this, from this external eye. We also hope that the other system, education system, which is presented within European Schoolnet, can also be inspired by that exercise, not just the initiative implemented in the country, but also the reflective question coming out of it. And it's also important for us within European Schoolnet as brokers of evidence from research, but also from policy and from practice, to have that kind of learning happening. We are all working in uncertainties, rapid change, and we have to recognize that we, we still have to learn a lot. We cannot come with the solution and just evaluate if you comply with the solution, with the, with the evidence. So, Coming back to this first case study to Portugal, uh, this is the reason why Maria Joao sits, Orta sits close to, to with us. Uh, I've mentioned the peer learning between countries. We wanted to, we couldn't give you the floor all the time, so we asked one country, and it's Jan de Kramer from, from, from Flanders, who, who is with us to also give his own uh, testimony about what is happening in, in Flanders. And I've mentioned a study visit. We were three uh, going to Portugal to visit the school and have interviews and discussion. So I'm pleased to introduce Janet Looney from uh, EISP. You have all the details there. And uh, based in, in Paris. And uh, Marthe Lampere 
from the University of Tallinn, who was also part of the, of the delegation. I suppose there is no need for me to just say, I'm Patricia Vastio and I'm uh, working at European School Lab. So uh, if it was not clear, it is clarified. Um, <laughs> so we, we will discuss three specific aspects during the session. The first one is what is concerned in the transition plan in Portugal uh, in terms of uh, capacity building effort. We will also discuss specifically the point of digital learning resources strategy in, in, uh, in that uh, transition plan and also the ecosystem that is in place in Portugal to support the change in school. Um, we have seen how active you can be this morning and how you can come with excellent questions. So we are expecting the same this afternoon, even if there has been a lunch between the two uh, sessions. So please, we, after each topic, we will turn to you. You will be able to or comment or uh, ask questions for clarity or to know more about what we have discussed. Uh, but let's start from an input from the first concerned. Um, and maybe you would be all interested to directly hear before entering into the discussion from Maria Joao what was the strategy supporting their digital education transform, uh, transition plan that is still running till the end of 2024, right? Five, Five sorry. Five. So Maria Joao, so, tell us uh, about the strategy. Okay, I will try. So first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I would mm -hmm. like to really um, say that uh, um, participating in this, uh, having this possibility of uh, having the experts and having you in Portugal looking to the things that we are doing, it's a huge opportunity uh, to have this uh, outside vision for the work that we are uh, doing. But um, uh, before going uh, inside the, the digital action plan that we have, I think that uh, I'd like to do a quick uh, kind of zoom out because um, this uh, initiative, it's not um, separated for, uh, the, from the rest of the work that we are carrying on in our country. So let me begin to say that uh, the perspective and the vision for education in Portugal is, uh, is, uh, is something very, very centered in, uh, in having inclusive schools. So uh, inclusive education is the pillar for education uh, in Portugal. So connected with this, of course, we have the curriculum giving more uh, autonomy and flexibility to the schools, uh, putting the things that uh, really matter inside the curriculum, but then giving, gi giving opportunities for schools to take decision on that. And of course, also very important, the national strategy for citizenship. So this is the, the, the vision for the, 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 the education. And then, of course, uh, with the pandemic, we, we all, it was not just the case of Portugal, it was the case in many other countries, the needs of, uh, of uh, having investment in terms of uh, digital. Mm -hmm. Not just because of pandemic, of course, because of pandemic, because the students were at home and uh, in Portugal we keep the, the classes running with the teachers uh, doing uh, the work with the students, um, even with the schools closed. Uh, so the infrastructure, the, the laptops, computers, and so on, the connectivity, we, we already knew, but it was uh, well, in the front of all people. Uh, so um, having this, uh, this uh, plan for a digital transition in education, uh, it was mandatory. Uh, and uh, in 2020, it was a resolution from the Council of Ministers in April of 2020 to do a huge investment. But the investment, it's... Well, you can put money on the problems and then you don't solve them because you don't have the, the right strategy, you don't have the right vision. So um, coming again to this uh, perspective of an inclusive, uh, inclusive school, that means that uh, uh, the students, independent of or uh, regardless of their uh, uh, individual situation, social situation, they, they should acquire the best education they, they could uh, in the school. Um, and uh, and uh, for that, uh, well, I'm going to the, to the digital uh, plan. That means mm -hmm. that we need uh, to uh, reinforce the infrastructure in schools. So the first dimension is uh, computers for all students. I'm speaking about a plan what, which it was not a pilot. It was for all the country, for all the students, and for all the teachers. And I think that this makes the difference mm -hmm. because before of that, we were working with European school net, mm -hmm. with the commission, and so on, with lots of projects. but. 
some smallest, some biggest, but at the national level with this dimension, I think it was the first time that we have it in Portugal. And we have uh, um, projects in this field since the 80s. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have the first big project in Portugal uh, for computers in schools uh, in 1985. Uh, so big experience at the time, but of course with the, the, all the, the, the improvement in technology, the things then changed a lot. So again, uh, national plan means uh, huge investment in infrastructure, connectivity, and computers for all students and teachers. Uh, then digital resources uh, connected with the curriculum. So digital resources for uh, all the subjects, but also in terms of interdisciplinarity, uh, because in terms of the um, autonomy and the flexibility in the curriculum, this is an important aspect of, uh, of the changing that we have in uh, our law uh, for curriculum. And uh, in the third, but maybe the, the most important, the capacity building of our teachers. So we designed a big program uh, with a huge response coming from the teachers. So we have, we began in 2021, and we are going to finish in the end of 23, and with almost every teachers uh, doing, doing this, uh, this, um, this uh, professional development. So I'm not speaking about training, it's more than that, it's professional mm -hmm. development, and I, I can go deeper on that uh, later on. But this is the perspective uh, for the first minutes that you gave me. Indeed, we, I think that the three of us were quite impressed precisely by the scale of your initiative, because as you clearly mentioned, it was really aimed at including all the actors of the education system, primary, secondary, and if I'm not mistaken, pre-primary too, up to uh, some extent. Yeah, yeah, no? yeah. So this was very uh, impressive, and it's interesting to discuss a bit the kind of uh, approach that you have used precisely for the capacity building side. Uh, Janet, you, you are particularly looking at that point, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it's for you to okay. speak about it a bit. Yes, sure, thank you. So um, I think just to start off, you, you've heard about the scale of the, the ambitions in, in Portugal, and I think it bears underlining it is no small thing to change the behaviors and practices and maybe even mindsets of thousands of teachers across a whole system in every school and classroom. Um, this is what we all struggle with when we were doing major reforms. So um, thinking about how to do that, it really takes a good strategic mindset and thinking about, in my context, how can I do that? And there are a number of decisions to be made. Um, and also learning from past efforts. So add to this um, the idea that um, digital education has been around for decades. Um, it hasn't really taken across systems in the way that people had hoped. So it's one of those wicked problems in education. How do you make that happen? In many ways, it does seem to be changing, partly because COVID, the, the backlash of too many computers um, being part of that, but also I think there's this now sense that the changes in digital technology, its new affordances for, for learning, all that timing makes this moment a little bit different. Um, I think also important to underline, although COVID was an important part and this reform was happening during COVID, what we observed is the way that digital education is being used in the classrooms is more like a blended learning approach. It's not the distance learning and lecturing and learning how to, to do things online when you can't be face to face, but it's really how do you use the digital technologies in an interactive way? How does that change my pedagogies? How does that change my relationship with my students? So all those things need to be considered. Um, I think in line with this and in line with all the kinds of changes that Mario Joao has been talking about that have sort of built up this idea that we're changing pedagogies overall, that we're not knowledge-based only, that we're asking for students to be really engaged with their learning, to be more self-regulated and so on and so forth. Um, it meant that this had to be a pedagogy first approach. So this is also a more sophisticated kind of training that you might need than just saying, well, here's some tools, here's some technical kinds of skills that you might need, and then go forth and do what you want to need, what you want to do. So um, I'll say that in Portugal, you kind of chose a Rolls-Royce approach to, to the teacher training, and, and certainly the timing and the immediacy of it during COVID, and um, the, the availability of new infrastructure with laptops and so on and so forth uh, was part of that. 
Um, but there was, a, you know, how do you reach all these teachers and do this in an effective way for something that's relatively sophisticated of, you know, trying to think about how to integrate technology with pedagogy and how to make it work. So um, I think uh, the choice of using diagnostic tools in every school, um, looking at um, the, the DigiComp for, for school diagnosis and the, the uh, check-in tool that you have in Portugal, to look at different levels and what the needs were and the gaps were and then have teachers go into training at their appropriate level was a good start on that. And this is, you know, the, the DigiComp, for example, is evidence-based, um, so it's also a way of, of gathering information and the perspective of everyone, everyone in the schools about the digital ca capacities. Then tailoring the, the uh, professional development to those needs was the next step. And there were three levels, I believe, and at each level, um, the teachers who are in the training get a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more independent, and have more opportunities to sort of think about, how do I use this in my school? What could I lead? How will this change in my subject area? And so, and so on and so forth. So um, it was quite an interesting training strategy, and it did reach, I think, just about every school in the country, which is quite unusual. Um, so there was quite a bit of enthusiasm around this. Um, Following that, of course, you know, one-off one trainings are not going to change the world, and this has only been three, three years into the strategy. So other parts of the strategy were important within the school to continue the learning, um, to have school-level plans and follow up on those plans and evaluate the implementation, how teachers were using things, have communication in the subject departments and projects and thinking about how to use the tools and also use the tools to, to track your school's progress. All those things needed to be put into place. The school distributed leadership in the schools. Um, that was important to think about. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things we heard about was the professional learning networks that kind of emerged spontaneously. So what we know from research is teacher professional learning and networks is one of the most effective approaches to professional development. And so this is a, a good way also to follow up on, now you have the tools, how do you use them, how are you using them in your classroom, what can we learn from each other? Um, and it's, I think we've got this good start here um, in a way that, um, you know, was probably, it was a Rolls Royce, but also very efficient in a way. <laughs> so I think um, there's also the strategy involved quite a lot on, on learning resources, and Mart was the expert here. So. But maybe before moving to, to digital learning resources, uh, it would be interesting to, to hear from you, Maya Joao, uh, how, what, what have you learned from the, the choice that you've made to go the way you, you did for training this large scale of teacher? What did you learn from it? Um, first of all, it's, it's amazing when we listen to someone <laughs> uh, telling the history that we are living. So, and it, it is completely uh, like that. I, I'm not sure if it's a Rolls Royce. Yes, it, it was, and it is expensive, but I'm not sure <laughs> if uh, in terms of man, uh, maintaining the Rolls Royce working, it's, I think that sometimes we buy the Rolls Royce and then we don't have money to, to put them <laughs> working. So I hope that is not the case in Portugal. But coming back to the, to the decision of how are we going or how should we at the time, at the moment, in the 2020, how do, should we design the, when we think about uh, this scale of, uh, of uh, uh, professional development? Uh, the, 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 the model that seems easiest, the easier uh, model was the cascade. So in the beginning, we thought that maybe we'll prepare trainers and then trainers will do the same with the teachers. And in a certain moment, we decided not to do like that. Mm -hmm. And it was a very uh, difficult decision. Uh, because usually what we see is, OK, to do in a big scale, we should do it in cascade. So when we decided not to do like that, it was a kind of, well, let us see how are we going to, to plan and to build this. So uh, we uh, began to define a, a profile for trainers. And because we have a network of uh, training centers in Portugal, all around the country, more or less kind of uh, one, almost 100 uh, training centers, uh, we, at the regional level, uh, we ask them to uh, see the profile of trainers and to uh, give us names 
for us to contact them. Of, of course, that to, for them to be a trainers, they have to be certificated by an uh, independent entity mm -hmm. that we have in Portugal, which is scientific and pedagogical sci um, for, 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 for uh, training in uh, professional development of our teachers. Uh, so we got more or less 1,000 uh, 1, trainers. We began first with the 700, and then we, we saw that we need more. Um, and uh, and uh, we work with them to give them the vision, to give them this perspective that it's not just to teach about tools. Because we were still in the pandemia and the teachers are asking for tools. And we decided if it's such an investment, we can just teach tools for teachers because uh, in two or three years, the tools are different and we should begin from from the beginning. So uh, we decided that uh, uh, we were going to prepare these trainers, give them and discuss with them the vision, the things that we really would like to change in the, in the, in the, the system in education. Uh, because we know from the research and from our experience that uh, uh, having these digital environments, these digital contexts, this, uh, this vision for uh, digital skills that we heard in the last panel could uh, transform the education. It's, it's uh, very, very powerful to change the conditions and to change the, the environments where the students are learning. And uh, at the same time, to respect uh, the autonomy of the students and for them to do different paths and to learn different things. And the, the digital tools and digital environments are very powerful for, for that. So the vision, then of course we discuss methodologies uh, in terms of uh, what are the best methodology to work with teachers. Um, and uh, we, we plan specific activities with them. And in the end of this training, we uh, pick all the trainers and we put them in an online community. So we keep working uh, with them. They begin the, 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 the courses and uh, they come to the community to say the things that are going well, but the, the problems that they are, they are facing. And the, one of the problems is that they need specific resources for subjects, because if they are going to change the activities inside the classroom, uh, if the, the background, because our trainers are all teachers, mm -hmm. and many of these trainers came from the background of uh, informatics and ICT. So when they go to work with teachers, imagine history teacher or geography teachers, they, uh, for them not to focus just in the uh, digital tools, they need to have um, didactic resources. So we uh, order um, didactic resources specifically for different subjects and we put that, uh, those resources inside the online community of our trainers so for them to explore but at the same time for them to uh, work directly with the authors of these uh, mm -hmm. resources and to be more well um, kind of uh, uh, secure in the way mm -hmm. they are working with the uh, teachers that uh, are coming from different areas of knowledge. Uh, so I think that uh, this, is, this was a, a good decision in, mm -hmm. in the end. And uh, at the same time, and uh, Janet uh, spoke about that, it was that uh, uh, teachers received different level of trainings mm -hmm. uh, it, that was connected with their own profile in terms of uh, digital competencies. So the, we used the, the, the frameworks built by commission. They were very important because with the, those references, people understand teachers and leaderships understand what do we want to transform mm -hmm. in schools. So uh, if a teacher uh, using the, and the, it was a volunteer, and we have almost all the teachers uh, using the check-in tool, uh, and then with a very complex system because of the, the data protection and so on, we could uh, then uh, give the information to the training centers and they invited teachers to come to a specific uh, training. So some of them came to the level one, which is, okay, uh, you don't know many things about uh, using digital tools, teaching in a digital environment, but well, uh, come because we are all in the same boat mm -hmm. and we are going to move uh, forward. Uh, many of them, uh, the big majority, they were, uh, um, they were in the second level, so they went deeper in terms of pedagogy and to uh, see the, how are we going to, to work in uh, specific subjects uh, and, uh, and then the level three for innovators and so on. And just to finish, saying that uh, we didn't begin uh, by this. We began with the training for leaderships. Mm -hmm. 
because if we don't have the leaderships, the principals of the schools uh, with the vision and the understanding the, 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 the purpose of all of this investment, then it will be difficult to have the teachers in training and uh, the doing this process of transformation. So just before moving to the digital resources that are related to uh, the training in a way and the changing practice, Maybe a quick comment from your side, Jan, about how you approach large-scale teacher training yes. in Flanders. Sure, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, our policy plan was actually also a response to, to the COVID crisis, despite also we have like policy measures since the 90s, a little bit later than you, but anyway. Um, and policy and uh, professional development of teachers was actually one of the four main pillars of our, of our policy plan. And uh, we tried to have like a um, holistic approach with different types of measures uh, to, to prof professionalize the teachers. One of the first things that we did was to provide to schools extra budget for buying in in-service training on the market. That was uh, mm -hmm. one of the measures that we took. And then another one, very easy, was that we wrote the DIGCOMP EDU framework in our policy plan. And that's like just one sentence which is in the policy plan, but it actually had quite a big impact mm -hmm. because um, we avoided having discussions on what are those necessarily uh, competences that the teacher should have. So actually the uh, very straightforward framework of DIGCOMP EDU helped us to have all the uh, noses in the same direction with a lot of stakeholders that have, have a role to play in it. The in-service training providers, the school, uh, the school education providers, the ministry, things like that. So that was very helpful. Uh, then the third uh, measure was we also created a tool uh, like Selfie for Teachers, but adapted to the Flemish context, um, which is called DigiSnap, and it's also a tool where teachers could actually scale their own uh, competences. And uh, this is related directly to, uh, to a database with professional development uh, courses. So we didn't have that either before COVID, and we took the uh, opportunity of, uh, of the D DigiSprung uh, action plan to create such a database. And when you, do the, when you uh, scale your competences, you're immediately led to courses in our, uh, in our database. And then last but not least, we, we created a lot of extra offer on, uh, on training courses mm -hmm. as well. And those were not very particular on, on tools or, or, or things like that, but very general on, um, on digital transformation. So it, uh, the, the courses that we developed called boot camps uh, were uh, meant for a whole school approach, for, for the school leaders, for the teachers, for the ICT administrators. And they follow a certain, yeah, a certain trajectory starting with an intake, it's discussed with the schools what uh, their basic situation is, what they want to achieve, and then again we go back to, to the DIGCOMP EDU framework. All the teachers have to do the DIGISNAP, have to fulfill that, that tool, and then uh, we see with the school um, on what particular elements within DIGCOMP EDU uh, we, work, we will work on, and that's, uh, that's two, two uh, of the aspects of DIGCOMP EDU that, uh, that we will work on. And then they get the actual training um, being hybrid. So there's uh, online modules, but also physical training. And then there's an in the implementation uh, trajectory as well. Um, so those four elements, mm -hmm. policy, um, offer training, offer the DigiSnap tool, and the uh, extra budget together form actually the portfolio of, of our CPD um, pillar within our policy plan. Okay, thank you. It's interesting to notice that in, in both situations, Digcom Pedu has played a, a key role, so it's important that it is there and it seems to, to be working. And also it's interesting to see that there are differences. You turn to private offer for training as part of, while here in, in Portugal you, you, you create it and you manage yourself with the support of the system. We'll come back to that later on. But if we want to see a change happening in practice, we know that teachers need to have available digital learning resources to support their practice. So this is also one aspect that we have investigated during the, the study visit. So Mart, you, you focus on that aspect, so. Yes. Uh, 
this was my specific yeah. focus in, in this uh, case study. Uh, and um, as you know, probably, in prob uh, most likely in all countries in Europe at least, uh, uh, this digital learning resources uh, uh, live and grow in two uh, very different ecosystems. Uh, one is uh, commercial, professionally produced by publishers, where they have their own workflows and quality assurance systems and licensing policies and platforms to access it uh, and distribute uh, the, the resources to schools. And then there is another uh, ecosystem of open educational resources, uh, which uh, in many countries are uh, created mostly by teachers, uh, but also by universities, uh, by some interest groups, uh, some non-governmental organization, for instance, or industry representatives. Uh, I, uh, at least in Estonia, for instance, uh, big banks have created uh, financial literacy resources, excellent ones, by the way, or forestry uh, companies have created uh, uh, something in their niche. Uh, so what was interesting to learn in this case study uh, about Portugal was that uh, they've, they've done this uh, uh, switch, uh, they've, they've made the switch to a digital textbook uh, in, in very ambitious and very systematic level. Uh, uh, so all the schools uh, who uh, decided to join the digital textbook pilot, uh, they had to commit themselves for six years uh, to use uh, this specific digital textbook for this specific subject, it means that they had to give away the printed textbooks. So they couldn't use them in parallel. This was complete uh, substitution or replacement uh, with, the, with the new technology. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, you probably know this uh, uh, model uh, of, of digital transformation uh, called RAT, R-A-T, uh, by Hughes. Uh, which describes that uh, on the first uh, level, on the first stage, uh, the uh, new digital technology is used to substitute or replace some existing technology. For instance, digital textbooks replaces the printed textbooks. And then once it is completed on a systematic level and uh, in a sustainable manner, so there will be no fallback, uh, uh, then you move on uh, to, to the next level, which is called amplification, it means that you start to use this new technology to, to amplify uh, or augment uh, uh, your, your core practices, uh, which is in, in education, core practices are teaching and learning. Uh, so it means that the pedagogical innovation starts only on the second uh, level. And then on the third level in RAT model, uh, this is a transformation where you actually achieve this, uh, the, the um, uh, deep change in in uh, in how the education is is, is delivered. Uh, uh, so it was interesting to observe in in Portugal that uh, that these uh, uh, digital textbooks, although they were very systematically implemented because of your policy decisions. Uh, uh, it, I don't see how they can actually go to this amplification and transformation level. Uh, uh, maybe in the future, but at this point, I didn't see even ambition in, uh, by publishers to, to, to go there. Uh, and also, the ministry kind of uh, probably, uh, or, or your agency, you, you saw that your hands are too short, as we say in Estonian, for, to, to actually have an influence uh, on, on publishers. So they have their own logic uh, how to handle this, uh, this process, and they are not very much interested in uh, bringing in some radical pedagogical innovations in the platforms. Uh, but instead of this, you, had, you, you created this parallel ecosystem of uh, what you call open educational resources, but these are not created by teachers. These are created actually by high-level professionals uh, from universities and uh, other partners. And this is where you actually invest in this innovation, both pedagogical innovation, uh, like in this Periscope Island platform, which is uh, very uh, attractive and inspirational uh, attempt to gamify uh, uh, education 
both in humanities and, and math and sciences, uh, uh, and even more ambitious, uh, this um, new platform that, that actually aspires to use some elements of artificial intelligence in, in doing some deep analysis of uh, personal learning paths of each learner and uh, uh, to, to recommend some next steps, next activities, next resources uh, for a specific learner that is the, the suit them. Uh, but interesting was also that uh, this teacher-created resources, uh, in your case, belong to the, the commercial world. Because publishers uh, are quite actually flexible when it comes to uh, expanding this ecosystem of commercial uh, digital textbooks with teacher-created resources like worksheets, presentations, uh, some, uh, I don't know, lab uh, protocols, uh, many, many others. So, um, uh, and maybe you would like to comment uh, that, uh, how did you reach this uh, decision and are you happy with it? Uh? <laughs> let's, let's wait and see <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in a few years. Well. Uh, when it comes to content, digital content, digital resources, well, it's a, it's a very tricky question because um, some years ago in Portugal we decided that we would like to have a platform with the teacher resources to share. And it was a huge <laughs> headache, <laughs> a huge problem. Because at the time, uh, everything connected with the, the the data protection and the images that the teachers are using and the videos and so on. Nobody cares, or teachers, they, they really don't care about mm -hmm. uh, authors and so on. So in the end, we have a huge portal uh, with lots of uh, resources that should be made by teachers, but in the end, just small part of it, it were made in terms of um, of uh, the production of the images and videos and so on. So we decided that uh, it's not the way of, of going. Of course, at uh, schools, they have their own platforms. They have their own resources that some of the teachers inside the school produce and so on. But it's a school responsibility about the things that are open or closed or whatever. And we, uh, the, the schools are completely free to, to take decisions at, at uh, that point. Then on the other end, we have the pub publishers. So in Portugal, a long tradition of, of having publishers producing the textbooks. And uh, with lots of quality, I have to, to tell you, uh, in terms of uh, scientific uh, content, in terms of pedagogical content. And we, uh, in, inside, uh, inside my, my, my DG, which is a DG for education, we, uh, uh, we pay to external, uh, external entities like universities and so on to certificate uh, the textbooks to be sure that uh, the content and so on is, is, is good uh, and, uh, and with quality. When, uh, um, uh, and of course, that, um, the, the, the biggest pr publishers, they were producing digital resources since long time ago. And during the, the pandemic, they have their own platform. So um, we, at the national level, we pay the textbooks. So the families, they don't have to pay for textbooks. They are free for, for all the students. So during the, the pandemic, but if the family want to have the access to the digital resources, they have to pay to the publishers. During the pandemic, they open their own platforms so a kind of agreement with Ministry of Education, they open, so they get popular in terms of the resources that they, they have there. Uh, in the end, when the pandemic uh, finished, they close the platforms again. So we try to, to negotiate with them in, in terms of the quality of those digital resources, in terms of, uh, in the future, uh, instead of we are paying the textbooks in paper, we can pay them the digital resources. And they say, no, we don't want the, that kind of business. We would like that you pay the licenses, but we are not going to sell you the content. Uh, and they are asking much more money for that than they are asking for the, the, the textbooks in, in paper. So then it came the, 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 the funding from commission, the resilient and refunding, uh, refunding uh, funding, so uh, it was a decision, a political decision, of course, uh, and uh, at a political level, in terms of policy level decision, it was uh, 
the decision that uh, we will uh, spend a part of that money producing <coughs> the resources that we think that make sense with the vision in terms of the pedagogy and in terms of the designing of the resources. So we have a huge open call uh, for companies, publishers, universities and so on. And in the end, it was the universities that came saying, well, we'd like to, to produce those kind of resources. And they are doing that for now. And publishers are a bit, well, not so comfortable as that. But I think that in the future, they will come to, 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 to this. And, and, uh, because the, the big difference is that, as you told us, uh, one thing is to have a textbook and then transform it in a digital content. And the content is the same for all independent of the feedback or the tools that you put inside, but the content is the same for all. The difference in this designing of the, the, the resources that we are doing now is that the content is different. So with the help of the AI, you can put different content and the students can do different paths inside the, 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 the resources. So they could uh, learn by themselves, they could learn together with the, with the colleagues, or because the teachers say, well, okay, you should use this or that. So it's, it's a, a different vision because it's connected with the pedagogy and it's connected with the digital environments for learning. What is interesting to know also maybe for you is that the, the process related to the digital learning resources has started a little bit later. Yeah. So you still have a bit of time yeah. to see how this will evolve and to adjust your, your decision. But it's interesting to, to hear from you, Jan, uh, especially with your responsibility in Digisprom, how Flanders is, yeah. has developed a strategy about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I must say that the, the context in Flanders <laughs> is very similar to the one in, in Portugal, um, meaning that the, the freedom of education is, is absolutely total when it comes to learning resources. I mean, schools mm -hmm. are totally free to buy uh, to buy learning resources on the market or to develop themselves or whatever so they, they have that freedom um, the same also is that originally we have like this very strong um, traditional educational publishers who try to innovate who do invest in technological solutions in in digital solutions but at the end of the day sell paper I mean that, that's a re reality. Um, and the digital uh, tools that they develop are more the add-ons, not the methods themselves, but like uh, uh, exercise generators or, or games mm -hmm. uh, for exercising, not the actual methods. Um, so for us in, in Digisprung, it was quite hard uh, to, uh, to have a pillar. We have four pillars, and, and one of those four pillars is exactly learning resources but it's, uh, it's limited for us as a ministry of what we can do. So what we did was actually focusing very much on open educational resources. Uh, those are things that we have done uh, for many years. We have an open educational resource uh, repository called Classament, which is very popular, and where, uh, where teachers are sharing their content and using from, from each other. And that's a service that's provided by the Ministry of Education. Um, we have set up a second repository with uh, digital archives um, tied to the curriculum, tied to the subjects uh, in, in Flanders, so they don't have to get access to, to millions or billions of, of hours of video, but to, to uh, like 20, 25,000 assets tied to the curriculum. So um, we used also the, the RRF money to... Uh, yeah, to further develop those two repositories and to make extra um, features and especially those features are meant to also support those those publishers uh, to give you one example um, we, we, we with the digital archives um, provider we tried to to build a feature to embed more easily the content so they could like embed it in their traditional methods uh, so, that, so teachers can access it directly via links or so in the, in, in, uh, in the, in the textbooks or in the, in the methods. Um, what we also did was to, um, to try to promote the um, access, a better access to, to the digital learning resources uh, by providing a single sign-on infrastructure, which we didn't have. So we also mm -hmm. took the opportunity to, to, to build that. 
And uh, another uh, aspect of, of better access is a particular focus on pupils with special needs. So, uh, for instance, um, pupils with special needs, they get uh, free access to the, to the digital format of the textbooks. Uh, and also the reading software is provided uh, free of charge um, by the tendering that we do as a ministry, so it's free for the pupils. And that's, I think, quite, uh, quite unique. And furthermore, uh, we tried to innovate. Uh, so we had different uh, innovation programs. Um, one, uh, one is, uh, two, two of them, two of the three uh, programs that we, that we established are really meant for the technical and vocational uh, sectors. So we have InnoVet, which is like innovating in the vet sector, uh, but also an, an XR an XR action plan, and uh, that's another specific action plan uh, where we um, bought as a ministry um, the, the gear for virtual reality uh, or augmented reality, and we put that in a kind of lending system so schools can know where they, where they have to go to to, to use uh, these uh, virtual reality gear, and, and they can use it uh, in their school, and then it can rotate to other schools. Also a library with virtual reality um, content and uh, also uh, professional development again and research uh, on, on those specific topics. Um, and then the, the final uh, one, the final innovation program is called Smart Education at Schools. And that's really purely experimenting. So uh, we ask schools to, to come to us with their, uh, with their uh, problems that they face and then there is a kind of matchmaking uh, with uh, the attack sector, and, it, um, and, and then they try to develop tools that uh, commit to the problems that, that the schools face, and that's run together with, uh, with EMEC, which is a large uh, uh, technological research institute in Flanders. So those are a few of the projects that we've done within Digisprong and with the Digisprong Action Plan. Okay, so I suppose you understand the difficulty of sharing with you all this complexity, all this number of different activities and components in your initiative. Uh, we will turn to you in, in a moment, I promise. But I also promised that we would say something about a specific aspect we have observed in, in Portugal, that is the existence of a kind of net across the school that we consider very important. Why? Because we know that we usually face with innovation a gap between the intention and the initiative and the training that is organized and the change in the school. So the gap of practice, the gap of implementation, as we call it. And we, have no, we know from research, we have evidence about the fact that for teachers coming from training, what will not automatically translate into a change of practice, there is a need for the practitioners, the teachers, and, and also partly the, the school leaders to have a space and to have time. To have a space, it means a place where first they can start testing the new practice, using the new tools, new, new, using the new process. And they need to discuss with their peers about where it has led them, where it has led their student. How was it? What were the obstacles? How to improve? Is it right? Is it not right? So they need that kind of reflection with peers. They also need, potentially, to turn to a provider of training to complement the original training that they have received. And we have seen in Portugal, around every school, and this is very important, a net of three kinds of support. One is a network of digital ambassadors. Every school has access to one digital ambassador that is a teacher, who is a teacher, not part of the school necessarily, sometimes it is, but not necessarily, but every school has access to a digital ambassador. On top of that, they also have access to a teacher training center. And again, every school has access to a specific teacher training center. And on top of that, they also have access to ICT competence center that, are, that have been created uh, for integrating digital into the curriculum. And you have this net of three network surrounding the school 
and helping them to cope with the implementation of the change on the long term, because they are still there, they exist at least for the time being, they exist. Mm -hmm. So they are there around precisely to give teachers that space to discuss and reflect and the time that needs a change of, of practice. So we will not have the time to enter into the discussion, but what was also very interesting is to notice that people that are digital ambassador in Portugal and teacher trainers that are part of the teacher training center, almost all of them are teachers. They still teach part of their time in the school and they are in a way seconded, if we could say it that way, to have the others. And of course, it creates tension. It's an incredible added value from what we have seen. At the same time, Portugal, as many other European countries, face an issue of lack of teacher, shortage of teacher. So it put pressure on the schools because teachers are partly taken out of the school to share expertise and knowledge with the others. So these are the very interesting points we would like to discuss. Yes, Mart? Yeah, I would like to add <coughs> one more thing uh, that, as I understood from interviews, is that uh, the Digital Ambassadors is the uh, youngest network uh, and that is created as a part of this uh, recent strategy. But actually, the other two networks mentioned by Patricia uh, were actually quite old ones. So it means that uh, this actually surprised me a lot because in Estonia, we quite often that we have a new minister uh, with new agenda, and then they kind of uh, kill all uh, the, the existing structures and, uh, uh, and then uh, redirect the resources to, the, to create some, something new. And uh, I've seen it also happening in many other countries. But you managed to use these uh, existing resources and networks and make them work together in very, uh, in very effective and efficient manner and to put uh, digital ambassador in the middle of it uh, between the schools competence centers and training centers like a, like a communication hub or, or glue that actually glues them all together it, it was brilliant really I liked it <laughs> yes you can come on very quickly and then we will pick I, I, I questions will because I think that the, this point is very important we tend to um, to have this vision that the new ministers change everything that uh, the others made. And I think that uh, education is a bit more resi resilient than, than that. Uh, so sometimes the minister thinks it's changing the things, but it's <laughs> called resist to the change. <laughs> sometimes it's not good every day, well, but sometimes it's good. So these kind of networks, I think that uh, mainly uh, one very important thing, this uh, ICT competence centers, they are independent from the Ministry of Education. So they are in universities, Institute of Education, and so on. So the, the, the the university or the institute of education decided to have this ICT content center. And then the Ministry of Education supported it. Supported it with some money for the, well, the, the things that they need to buy and so on. And uh, putting teachers there. So they have, in general, they have the coordinator, which is a professor from the university, but then the uh, Ministry of Education put teachers uh, there. <coughs> teachers with experience, teachers that show that they know how to deal with the, the pedagogy in schools, which is sometimes quite different from the things that are happening at the uh, university level. So uh, I think that uh, the strategy is not having all the all these uh, these uh, uh, whatever groups or whatever inside the Ministry of Education. You have to put some things out because then they survive even mm -hmm. in the changing in, in education. And then we are reinforcing um, this network at. Uh, uh, teacher training centers because uh, the knowledge is in, in the center, still in the center. Uh, if you want to, to move forward in education, you have to have knowledge in, in specific places where to, and then you use that knowledge mm -hmm. and then and the competencies that were built during several years. So this system of networking of uh, training centers, they, they, they exist since the 90s and uh, they are not working just with the ICT or digital, they are working with the diversity and inclusion and citizenship and many other areas. So I think that uh, they will survive because they, they are showing that they are important and they can help uh, even ministers uh, with the new ideas for, 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 for the policy level. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we can at least take one question on the lens the time flying. So is there any question? Yes, we already have one. Please go. The micro is coming. No. Um, my question is for Maria. Um, in Malta, we are also working on uh, giving out laptops to each student, to each year seven student, that's middle school. Um, my question is this, is that um, obviously this is co-funded by EU funds. And the question that we are always asked is how is this going to reduce the rate of early school leavers? How, um, I don't know if you uh, had co-funding with this, but what are your thoughts on that? And my second question is, um, did you have any resistance from the teachers' unions when you're giving out laptops? Like, did they say that perhaps you're giving uh, teachers extra work, they have to keep up with the laptops, they have to keep up with traditional? So those are my two questions for you. Thanks. Well, um, about, uh, about, uh, about the, 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 the laptops, um, about the laptops, well, uh, it's 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 difficult when you imagine this this at the national level. So of course Portugal is quite a small country, but we are speaking about more than one million uh, computers. So um, the decision it was uh, I think that because of pandemic, of course I'm for sure. But uh, but uh, um, if you think and going to the early dropout, I think that uh, the early dropout it's a very important rate in every country. You can have, well, and we have today the pizza results. You can interpret it in a different ways. But when you look to the early dropout, you see if the students finish the secondary level education or not. If they finish, they will move to the, well, to the to, uh, higher, higher level of studies or they are going to the um, market uh, labor. So uh, if they don't, it's a, it's a problem because they are not prepared for, for, for going to study, whatever more, or they are not prepared to, to, to the, this complex world of, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the, the labor work, labor market. So in, in Portugal, the rate is reducing a lot. So we are at the 6% uh, of uh, early, which is a lot, but compared with Europe, we are much better than the, the, the other countries in Europe. And for me, this is the most important rate, and uh, I really appreciate that you mentioned that. So all the investment that you do in education, you can ask, well, what is the impact? And it's very difficult to measure the impact. But in the end, you see if the students keep in school and finish the secondary level of education. Uh, so I cannot say that it's because of computers, but of course that computers will contribute a lot because you are uh, giving tools and very powerful tools. And it's not just the computer, it's the digital compasses that you are developing because you are using the computers. So I think that this can make the difference. Of course, it's a huge problem for schools to manage all the computers because we are not giving the computers to the student or to the teacher, they belong to the school. Okay, and finish with unions. Very uh, Yes, uh, unions and teach. I myself, I'm a teacher, so we always complain about having more work. But uh, <laughs> we do we do different uh, things in a different way. So if I'm using digital tools, I don't have uh, so the, the the quantity of paper in my desk. So well, I keep doing some things, but I change the the process of working, and I maybe I, I'm not going to spend so many time. Uh, correcting texts or so on because the digital tools are giving feedback directly to my students. So it's a kind of dumb. Thank you. Okay, so, so you will be able to ask additional questions later on today, this evening, and tomorrow. Everyone is still there. So thank you a lot uh, for your attention. I just would like to announce that we have been very quick trying to present everything. But be reassured, a report will be published. The case study report will exist about Portugal. And it will be published uh, near the end of February and available on the European School Net website. You, you will be able to have a look to it. And we already uh, start planning the next one that will be about Italy. So just to announce that, uh, it's a series that we, we just start. And just to 
let you go with uh, a reflective question. Um, with those case studies, we, we just would like to make some contribution to a, a quotation I, I would leave you with. That is, there is nothing more frightful than ignorance in action. <laughs> Any idea wh who said that? <coughs> Maybe? Do we have, I will help you. Do, you have, do we have people from Germany around? Yeah? <laughs> no? <laughs> so, no more time dedicated to that. Maybe you can Google it. But I can tell you that it's, it's from Goethe. And what is interesting is that he was a philosopher, a writer, and a statement of the city of Frankfurt. So I think it's important to keep that kind of things in mind. And we try to contribute to reduce and, and increase the, the evidence base before taking action, if possible. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to all the panelists. And thank you.